I am. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a few quick announcements. First of all, do remember the new acts and facts are here. It's got a really cool picture of a stegosaurus on the front. ICR, as I mentioned this morning, has just put out some new films, which I have ordered, which actually have animatronics uh, where they show these creatures moving about, I suppose like in Jurassic Park, except here it's the creationist viewpoint, not the evolutionary viewpoint. So be sure to pick up a copy of that on your way out tonight. And also, be sure to pick up, and if you know anybody who needs a calendar for the last three months of the year, be sure to pick one of these up. I'd really like to give them away because they cost a lot of money. And so I'd rather have somebody using them than not using them at all. And then, of course, our 2017 pocket calendars. Uh, I found those to be extremely useful as I was flying this past week uh, to Presbytery. I had to take four different flights to do that, two on the way out, two on the way back, and hang around in a couple of airports uh, in Los Angeles and in Chicago in addition to Portland and Philadelphia. And so... Uh, I had opportunity to give quite a few of those away. In fact, I ran out on my last flight, and so I ended up having to take some of our old business cards, write the new church web address on it, uh, and hand it to the two ladies who were sitting next to me, inviting them to look at our uh, website. But it's printed on the 2017 calendar card, and so please pick those up and use them. Everybody will take a 2017 calendar card, uh, and it's also got a wonderful presentation of the gospel on the back of the card. Our need, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, sin's penalty. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's provision, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then the question, your response. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have you followed the Romans' road to salvation? So, please, pick up a few of those and give them out this week. Uh, let's beat all the other churches that are using these kind of calendar cards. We'll get the Bible Presbyterian cards to them first. So turn with your Bibles now, if you will, over to the book of Acts. Tonight we are looking at spiritual versus physical shipwrecks. There are both kinds. And God certainly predestines the physical shipwrecks in our lives. But some people also make a spiritual shipwreck of their life. And folks, we're held accountable for that. Whenever there's a spiritual shipwreck, you and I will be held accountable by God for what we have done. We'll probably have to finish that part of the message next week because there are many different ways in which you and I can make a spiritual shipwreck of our lives. We're over in Acts chapter 27. Tonight we'll be looking at verses 27 through 37, but I'm going to be, re be reading beginning in verse 13. Acts chapter 27, I'll start reading at the beginning of the storm. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Plauda, we had much work to come by the boat which, when they had taken up, they used helps under girding the ship, and, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strake sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceeding tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word tonight and help us so that we might understand that for the believer there is hope, guaranteed hope, based on the predestinating purposes of God even in the worst storms of life. And so Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we looked at the first part of this message last week so let's have a quick overview of the predestinated storms that are in our lives. The Word of God guarantees that we will go through storms in our lives. Some of you have been through some, and some of you have been through some pretty stiff storms. Not just physical storms, but the tests that God allows us to go through that refines us for the glory of Christ. 
And what we've seen over the last several weeks is that it is indeed the will of God for us to go through times of testing to purify us before he sends his blessing. Storms that come not because of our stupidity, but storms that come because God is refining us like Paul is being refined in our text here tonight and through that experience is going to have opportunity to share the good news of Christ with all those who travel with him and the good news of Christ when he reaches a certain island and when certain things happen to him and they think he's a God and then he tells them no he's not a God but he's able to heal a certain man and reach the ruler of the island the governor of the island and many people come to Christ the storm that put Paul exactly where he wanted him, where God wanted Paul to minister, where God had some of his elect whom he was going to draw to himself. If it had not been for that storm, they would have not ended up where they were. But because of that storm, they ended up in a very specific location so that certain people could be reached with the good news of salvation. We've talked about the suffering of believers. We've talked about suffering for the sake of Christ. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. We've talked about godly men and leaders who have suffered for doing what was right and gave the examples of Nehemiah and Job. We saw that all the events of Daniel and the captivity and the suffering of righteous people along with the wicked people were examples for us. We saw the prophets are our example of suffering. James tells us that in James 5. We saw the heroes of faith are our examples. We saw Jesus as our example. We saw other believers who are examples. And then we looked at one of the most important key passages in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 4. 19 verses are dedicated to the proposition that God has designed suffering in the life of the believer to purify us from sin. When we begin to suffer, the things of earth grow strangely dim. When we go through the times of testing and trial, all the things that stimulate our carnality tend to fade into the background. Peter says that, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. God uses suffering in the life of the believer to direct us into his perfect will for our lives, not merely for ourselves, but as we see in our text, for the sake of others as well. And so Peter closes that passage, For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. For if it begin first at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God made you. God sustained you. God will bring you through the difficult times of suffering which are guaranteed to every believer. In chapter 3, Peter has said, For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And Hebrews 10.36, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So last week, we tied predestination, election, and the sovereignty of God to the predestinated storms in our life. First, we began by looking at the elect. We saw that the term elect is used in seven different ways in Scripture. Every case refers to God making a choice, not us making a choice, and God making a choice specifically to choose an individual or a group for a preordained specific purpose. We saw first that the term elect is used of Christ. Christ is God's elect. We already saw how the storms of life affected him. Secondly, we saw the term elect is used of the holy angels in contrast to the fallen angels in 1 Timothy 5.21. And we made two observations about that. We noted that we're not told of any suffering that the elect angels must endure because, number one, they are not sinners, and number two, they are not substitutes for sinners. The reason we find suffering with Christ and with us is Christ is a substitute for sinners, and we are the sinners for whom the substitution is made. The second observation that we saw was Christ did not die for angels because the fallen angels have to pay for their own sins, just as humans who are non-elect must suffer the consequences 
of their own sins as well. Third, we saw the term elect is used of Israel in the Old Testament in multiple passages. Fourth, we saw that the term elect is used of Israel not just in general in the Old Testament, but it is used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. And we talked about how probably the next study that we'll be doing after Acts is the book of Revelation. But it's clearly used of Israel during the Tribulation in Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. Fifth, we saw that the term elect is used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. Luke 18, 7, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Sixth, we saw that the term elect is used of believers in the church age. Romans 8, 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. God's the one who declares us righteous. We are his elect. He declares us righteous on the basis of the blood of Christ. And so no one, not even Satan himself, was the accuser of the brethren, can make any of the charges stick. We looked at multiple passages in Colossians, 2 Timothy, Titus, and 1 Peter. Seventh, the term elect is used to describe local churches composed of true believers. We saw John uses it that way in 2 John 1, 1 and 2 John 1, 13. Then we looked at the related term election and saw that it falls into four categories. The first category, the term election, is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. It's used in contrast by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So God still has a plan for national Israel. Second, we saw the term election is used in the New Testament to distinguish between believing Jews and non-believing Jews. In other words, a distinction between national Israel as a group contrasted with specifically chosen Jews whom God has elected for salvation. That's Romans 11, verse 7. The third category, the term election, is used of individual believers during this period of time in which we live, which is called the church age. 1 Thessalonians 1.4, Knowing, brethren, beloved, and here he's writing to Gentiles, not to Jews, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. The fourth category that we studied is that there are three essential character qualities to election. The first element, or the first essential character quality, is election is not based on works. We saw God using it that way in Romans chapter 9, 11, speaking of Jacob and Esau, for the children not being yet born, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Election is not based on works. The second element we saw is that election is based on grace. Romans 11, 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. At no time in the history of the world have there been a complete lack of those who are among the elect. God always has a remnant somewhere on earth, even though it may be small as it was in the days of Noah, there's always a remnant who are among God's elect so that he keeps the seed going, the line of faith going, regardless of the persecution, regardless of the wickedness in the world surrounding us, there is always a remnant of grace. And that's a fantastic principle as you begin to trace it through Scripture. We've done that in the past. Perhaps we'll do it again in the future. It's a good thing to remember. There is a remnant of grace. The third element that we saw is that election does not negate human responsibility. Number one, it's not based on works. Number two, it is based on grace. Number three, that does not negate human responsibility. Second Peter 1.10 Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. We have a responsibility, and we do not negate that just because God is sovereign and does the electing. So tonight we want to study election in relation to predestination and make specific application to the storms in our lives. So we'll continue reading now down in verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not to have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there stood, shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. In other words, the ship is going to go down, but none of you are going to drown. Now, that's amazing. It's a humongous storm. It's a hurricane. They've been driven for many days in front of this hurricane. The boat is definitely going to sink. 
Most of these people cannot swim. And God makes a promise to Paul, which will certainly solidify what the Apostle Paul says when they're cast on the island. Not one of you is going to drown. That's incredible, folks. You think about the various hurricanes that have been hitting all over the world recently. We've got one called Matthew right now running around out there somewhere. Hurricanes all over the world doing gigantic amounts of damage and killing people. Even people who are on the land. Here's a tiny little boat on the Mediterranean. A hurricane whipping it across the sea. They cannot drive up against the wind. They cannot tack against it. They cannot go where they want to go. They go where the storm takes them. They throw everything out of the boat. They tie ropes around the boat so that the boat won't fall apart. Talked about helps girding up the ship. You remember we read about that. They're tying the thing together so that it won't bust apart with the waves. And not one of them is lost. Predestinating purposes of God for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. What an incredible promise. Those people on that boat did not die because there was a faithful believer among them. I wonder if our lives have ever had that kind of an impact on the people around us. There could have been, say on a train or in a car or an airplane, perhaps you've been on a boat, some of us have been on boats, there could have been a wreck, a sinking, a crash, and many people could have been killed. Maybe in eternity God will let us know of a time whereby he withheld something that would have happened if we had not been in the center of his will doing what he wanted us to do right at that moment. We don't know. Every time I get on an airplane I realize I could be on my way to heaven. And I pray. I pray for the pilot. I pray for the co-pilot. I pray that God will keep the plane from mechanical difficulty and from failure. That God will pray will keep that plane from all terrorism and all acts of war. I pray, Father, for the salvation of the passengers who are traveling with me. I pray to the Heavenly Father that he will keep us from inclement weather. That he will protect us from hazards on the ground and hazards in the air. Do you do that when you get on a plane? And you begin to pray for the people around you and realize that you might be the last witness that they have before they face eternity. That's why I like to carry tracks with me on the plane. <laughs> I ran out of them, like I told you, and had to use my little business cards and just write down the, the, the church web address. And I hope that some of those folks look at that web address and look at some of the things we have on our website. Do you do that when you travel? God puts you next to specific people for specific reasons at specific times. On one of my flights I sat next to a very talkative guy from El Salvador. A guy raised in a Christian home but married a Roman Catholic. Hadn't been in church for a while and so I said, you know, God put me next to you for a reason and he sort of laughed and blushed. I said, you know, you need to get back into a good Bible preaching church. And we had a talk for over an hour. When you travel, do you share Christ with the people that are sitting next to you? Do you give them a tract? Do you give them something so they can follow up? You might be the last witness they have before they step into eternity. Here's Paul. He's being faithful with it. These people know they're about to face eternity. And Paul gives them a good word. Now, one of you is going to die. We're going to lose the ship, yes. It was a bad mistake. There are consequences to your choices. Bad mistake. All that cargo is overboard. All the business deals that you guys wanted to have, they're all gone. Your money's overboard. But you're going to get out of it alive. By the skin of your teeth, you'll make it. I think most of them at that point didn't care about anything else. 
They were delighted that they were going to live. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, imagine that, a hurricane that lasts two weeks, and you are being driven for two weeks by a hurricane. And you are so seasick that you have not eaten a bite in two weeks. When was the last time you went, anybody here, for two weeks without eating a bite of food? Have you ever done that? Two whole weeks? That's what was happening here, 14 days. As we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and they sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they sounded again and it found it 15 fathoms. They would throw this weight on a rope that was marked overboard. Man, they realized they're getting closer and closer and closer to land. They can't see anything yet. Horrible storm going on. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, <coughs> Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Oh, oh. <laughs> There's a caveat to all of us getting alive to shore. You've got to make sure the sailors stay on board so that we make sure that they face the same problems we face. Then you'll know what I'm telling you is true. Nobody's going to get out as a result of human effort. Nobody's going to be saved as a result of their own private little lifeboat. You know, that's true in salvation as well. You're not going to be saved by human effort. You're not going to be saved by your own little lifeboat that you think is going to get you to shore safely while you leave everybody else behind. Except these remain in the ship. You're not going to make it. By this time, the soldiers are willing to listen to Paul. They'd listen to the shipmaster at first, but now they see the shipmaster's about to betray them. You want to betray us? Okay, we'll show you what we are. We're soldiers, and we got swords. And they cut off the boat. Whack! There goes the rope. There goes the boat. There goes all hope for the sailors, too. If anybody's going to be saved, it will be by the sovereign hand of God. What a lesson we can learn from that. The shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, now you think this is the most critical and the most scary part of the journey. We don't even have one lifeboat. The Titanic had some lifeboats and some people got away. Not everybody, a lot of people drowned. But now they don't even have a lifeboat. While the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Nobody was snacking during this period of time. You try to snack, it comes right back up. They were hanging on for dear life. Some of them probably had lashed themselves to something on the ship to keep from being washed overboard. They could not do a thing. They couldn't row. They couldn't sail. They let her drive. Paul says, okay, you've gone two weeks without eating anything. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. What does that remind you of? What did we do this morning? After the, the worship service this morning, we were reminded of what Jesus did. He took bread. And when he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, take, eat, this do in remembrance of me. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with the two in Luke chapter 24. And they didn't know who he was. And he opened the scriptures, as we said this morning. And, and he showed them himself in all the scriptures. And they got to their house. And those, those two, they were so excited about the Bible teaching they had just had. They'd never heard a Bible teacher like this before. They thought they hadn't. They'd actually heard Jesus before, but they didn't realize this was Jesus. 
And he sat down to eat. And it says, when he took the bread and when he broke it, their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. Paul is reminding them here of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. For Jesus is the one who's about to provide their salvation. And only he can provide their salvation in a storm of life like they're experiencing. That's true for us as well. When he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. Do you know how your life can change the lives of those around you as you face the storms of life? When you face them with panic and with fear, what does it do to help anyone else? But when you face the storms of life with absolute confidence in the sovereignty of God, it not only transforms you from inside out, but it has an effect on others around you. They see that you trust in the living God. It brings joy and not grief to the situation. It brings gladness and not fear to the trouble that's being faced. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred threescore and sixteen souls. That's two hundred seventy-six people. It's a lot of people. You know, that's not a little teeny weeny boat. That's a boat that is big enough to hold 276 people plus cargo. It's some kind of a big merchant vessel that's carrying grain, wheat probably, across the Mediterranean Sea. 276 people. Wouldn't you like it if we had 276 people here tonight? Do you think we'd have a few more seats filled than we have filled here tonight, 276? That'd be great, wouldn't it? Each one of these pews, say 10 people across on each pew. Some of you are spread out a little more than that, but 10 on a pew. And uh, you think, wow, maybe one, two and a half of the front here filled up. Think about those people living on a ship for several months. You have to have enough room to do that. You have to have enough food to keep them going. 276. God predestined that 276 people would live through the storm and that all 276 would be cast on a certain island. They wouldn't be separated, all of them floating around to different islands and all of them living, but all ending up in different locations. They were all going to the same place. You know, that brings to mind the sinking of the Titanic, the hundreds of lives that were lost because of the arrogance of one man. What a difference between Captain Edward John Smith, who blasphemy asserted that even God himself couldn't sink the Titanic, and the humility of the Apostle Paul, who said there's a sovereign God he can sink this boat anytime he wants, but he's told me he's going to save all of you alive. What a contrast in character. My brother produced a film on the Titanic. You know, the ship that rescued the survivors on the Titanic was a ship called the Carpathia. It steamed through the night after it had heard of the distress signals that the Titanic had sent up. Steamed through the night through heavy flows of icebergs at full speed and they were not able to see the icebergs but the captain stood on the bow of the ship praying that God would make a way through for them that they might rescue those who were lost and as the sun broke in the morning and they looked back behind the ship they saw an ice flow with no breaks at all where they had just come through. What a difference between 
captains of the ship. One who in puny arrogance shook his fist at God and one who in humility begged to rescue those who were lost. There was a third ship that could have rescued them all but backed off into the night. It was there as the Titanic was sinking, not after it sank. Maybe someday I'll show you that film. We go on. Predestination means that God predetermines our ultimate final destination and the destination of all moral creatures in advance. Let me say that again. I hope you're taking notes. Predestination means that God predetermines our ultimate final destination and the destination of all moral creatures in advance. There may be rough waves getting to it, but he has determined where we're going. He has predetermined our destination. That's what predestination is all about. He predetermines our outcome solely with his own glory in mind and with the good of his elect in mind. Number three, predestination is an expression of the sovereign will of God, not the will of man. Predestination is exp expressed in at least 11 different categories. Now, the first three of these categories relate to salvation. But God wants to make sure that we understand that salvation is related to his work and choice, not to our work and choice. So the first three of these expressions of the sovereign will of God relate to salvation and make us fully aware that salvation is a work of God and not a work of man. Number one, category one. Category one, salvation, being made children of God by adoption so that we are full heirs with Jesus Christ. Two different ways of being saved are mentioned in the New Testament, not two different ways, but, but two different pictures of salvation are given to us. The picture of birth, which is what Jesus talks about in John chapter 3, and the picture of adoption, which the Apostle Paul talks about, both in Romans and in Ephesians. The new birth, you must be born again, and then adoption. Birth brings you into the family, but you're not fully an heir at that point. Paul explains it. He says the child, as long as he's a child, he's still under tutors. But there comes a point in which the father, in Roman law, went through an adoption process of his own born children so that they would become full heirs and have right to the inheritance. And that's the first picture that the Word of God gives us in relation to salvation. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to, now listen to the last phrase, according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestination is an issue of the will of God. Not the will of man, but the will of God. So the first picture that we're given in relation to salvation is the picture of adoption, being made children of God by adoption. Category number two. Category number two, still dealing with salvation. How we are made children of God through sanctification. Being made children of God through sanctification. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, now here we have our predestination, here we have the will of God, here we have a choice God is making, not a choice that man is making. From the beginning, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth. The second thing that we learn about predestination is that God uses the doctrine of sanctification. That is, he sets us apart to salvation and belief of the truth. Which brings us to the third category of salvation. We are made children of God by faith. We are made children of God by faith. We saw that at the end of the preceding verse in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, uh, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, but it's emphasized once again 
In Acts chapter 13, verse 48, category 3, salvation, being made children of God by faith. Here's Acts 13, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And, now listen to this phrase, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. The ones that were not ordained to eternal life did not believe. You see, the predestinating purposes of God undergird the doctrine of salvation. We've seen three different facets of that marvelous diamond that God gives to us here. Categories one, being made children of God by adoption. Category two, salvation, being made children of God through sanctification. Category three, salvation, being made children of God by faith. That brings us to category number four, where we are predestined for something in the future. We are predestined to an eternal inheritance. Number four is predestined to an eternal inheritance. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things, not some things, not most things, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He says it five times in one verse. It's all of God and none of man. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Category five. Our time is flying. Category five. Predestined to have and to exercise specific certain spiritual gifts. You don't get to choose the spiritual gifts you get. God looks at the church all over the world and we are gathered together the church universal is gathered together in local churches. Visible expressions of what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. So that the world might see Jesus through us. God looks down and he sees Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood. He says they need certain specific spiritual gifts in that church so that they might fulfill the ministry and the mission that I've given to that local church. He may look down in the middle of Nebraska at a different church and say, you know, they need a different complement of spiritual gifts so that they can fulfill the ministry that I've given to them in central Nebraska. He looks down at a church in India and he says they need a specific complement of spiritual gifts which I will give to them so that they can fulfill the mission and the purpose of that particular local church. You say, where do you find that in the Bible? All right, let's look at it. That's over in Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 4, this is predestined to have and to exercise specific spiritual gifts. Hebrews 2, 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles. Now listen to the last phrase. And gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. You don't get to choose your spiritual gift. God gives it to you to edify the church. To build up the body of Christ. Paul spends three chapters on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. God is the one who chooses and gives the gifts specifically for the purpose of that local church and the ministry to which he is called that local church. Category six. Category six. We are predestinated. This is really interesting. This is way too big for us to cover this whole one tonight, but I'm going to at least give you a few verses on it predestinated for a special offering up to God. Predestinated for a special offering up to God. Now you'll understand what I mean by that in just a second. Over in James chapter 1 verse 18. Again, we go back to the will of God, to the sovereign purposes of God. And James writes in verse 18 of chapter 1, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. You didn't beget yourself. You didn't father yourself. None of us did. It was by someone else who fathered us that we were begotten. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Now look at the purpose. What was the will of God? What was his purpose in begetting us with the word of truth? He says that, that is giving you causation, telling you why he did it, that we should be a kind of first fruits 
of his creatures. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question, what in the world does that mean? Why does he say he, he begat us, he fathered us, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures? Well, you know that word first fruits, it shows up a number of times in the New Testament, and every time it brings you back to the feast of first fruits in the Old Testament. Now we are all familiar, I hope we're all familiar, with the way that that is used over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the resurrection, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, which means that we're also going to rise from the dead. Because the feast of first fruits in the Old Testament was the beginning of the harvest, where the first sheaves of grain were brought and waved before the Lord, either at the tabernacle in the Old Testament or at the temple later on in the Old Testament, which was an offering to God, which by faith they were saying, I'm bringing this even though I would rather hoard it for myself. I'd rather keep it and eat it because this is really good crops here. And, but I'm going to give it to God knowing that God will provide the rest of the harvest. Now James is using that word here. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. New Testament uses that term first fruits in a number of different ways. Perhaps we'll look at it another time, but let me just read you some of the verses. See if you can figure it out, because I'm not going to spend any time on it. We've only got 12 more minutes to go. Romans 8:23, and not they only, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Boy, there's a lot in that verse. You just have to write it down and check it out. Romans 16, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. That was Romans 16, 5. Next one, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. That's the one that we all know about that we just talked about. Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his comings. Makes sense to us. Then we get to chapter 16, one chapter later, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that he is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Then the verse that we started with in James 1.18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then the last one I'll give you, Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Fascinating. We move now to category seven. Category seven. Predestination. Predestined to bear spiritual fruit. Category seven is predestined to bear spiritual fruit. Jesus said that in John chapter 15, verse 16. Again, it goes back to the sovereign choices of God. Predestination always relates to the sovereign choices of God. And Jesus says it in verse 16. Ye have not chosen me. Now, I don't know how anybody can get around that. I mean, when the Arminians start talking about how they chose Jesus, you think, what Jesus are you talking about? Because the Jesus of the Bible said, you have not chosen me. But I have chosen you and ordained you. <laughs> Preordination, predestination, election is what's going on here. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And what does this predestination relate to in this verse? That ye should go and bring forth fruit predestined to bear spiritual fruit. And it's going to be a special kind of fruit. There's going to be fruit. There's going to be more fruit. There's going to be much fruit. There's going to be abiding fruit. And that's what Jesus talks about here, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know, it's interesting to see how many times in Scripture it talks about how we can ask of God and he gives us our requests. But there are all these little caveats along the way. One of them is right here in this verse. And that is that your fruit should remain, though whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
you've got to reach that stage of fruit bearing. Not just bearing some fruit, not just bearing more fruit, not just bearing much fruit, but bearing abiding fruit. Those are the four levels of fruit bearing you find in John chapter 15. You've heard me preach it. Then, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. Category number eight. Category number eight. Predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Now, we've talked about that in the past, so we'll not talk about it a lot tonight, but we'll at least give you the verses. Predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Ephesians 2.10. You all know verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that's pre-ordained, predestined, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's one of the ways that you tell a true believer. Because God has foreordained certain good works that we will walk in them. Now good works are not just helping little old ladies across the street. Good works are not what humans define as good works. Good works are always done to the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the word of God. If it does not fit all of those categories at the same time, it's not a good work from God's perspective. Predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Category 9. Category 9. Predestination in the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. Predestination in the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. That's a long one, so I'll read it again. Predestination in the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. That's Acts chapter 10, verse 42. Acts 10, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. That's coming. In the eternal counsels of God, Jesus was not only preordained to be the one who would be the sacrifice, not only preordained to be the one who was virgin born, not only preordained to rise from the dead, not only preordained to do all the works that he did on earth, but he was also preordained to be the one who would be the judge of the quick and the dead. Category 10. This is the one that many people don't like to hear preached. Category 10. Reprobation is also predestined. Reprobation is also predestined. That is, God not only chose some for salvation, God chose some for damnation. Sometimes it's called double predestination. But it states that in Jude 1, verse 4. Jude only has one chapter, but if you're trying to write it down so it makes sense, Jude 1, four. Jude writes, For there are certain men crept in unawares. There are people who sneak into churches. Did you know that? There are people who do all kinds of bad things in the churches to bring shame to Christ, to destroy the church, to get people off track on false doctrine, to get people off track on moral issues. There are people who creep in unawares. People aren't aware of it when they first come in. Now listen to the next phrase who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Before eternity passed. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. He's going to talk about two things here. He's going to talk about moral issues and he's going to talk about doctrinal issues. He hits the moral issue first. Turning grace into lasciviousness. The grace of God covers all our sins. That's very clear from 1 John chapter 1. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And yet 
these are the people that Paul also condemns. He says, what shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're dead, you don't respond to the realm of the living. If you're a dead corpse lying on the ground and somebody brings a juicy steak in front of you, you do not reach up and grab and eat it. If a, a scantily clad woman walks by a dead man, he doesn't suddenly sit up and take a look at her. He's dead. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Lasciviousness is uninhibited shamelessness where they don't care who sees what evil wicked thing they are doing they revel and they gloat in their immorality that is what is happening in our society we live in a lascivious society those of you who live in the Collingswood area probably got a mailing this past week and it shows two men who are deeply involved in public education. Full color picture, front and back, and a big long letter telling about how they have been partners for 38 years and how one of them is actually on one of the highest education boards in the state. And the other one is running for a school board position. They've been teaching in elementary schools. Totally unashamed of what their lifestyle is like. That's lasciviousness. And yet, demanding that everyone else recognize it as normal. That's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and, now here we get to the doctrinal part, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometime when we have more time, we'll talk about the issues of apostasy. But here they are, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Ten different categories relating to predestination. So with those categories in mind, we can be confident that the storms in our lives are designed by God to cause us to reach the specific destination, predestination, a before determined destination. You wouldn't want to get on a boat thinking that you were going on a cruise that was going to take you out to the Bahamas and suddenly that cruise takes you across the Atlantic Ocean and drops you off on the coast of some uninhabited jungle area. You've got a predetermined destination. You're on God's boat. God says, I'm going to make sure that my boat gets exactly where I want you to be. We can be confident that the storms in our lives are designed by God to cause us to reach the specific destination that he has planned for us because God always reaches his goal. It says so in Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to be wobbly about it. We are confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul looked at his shipwrecks with confidence that those things were designed by God to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. You know he had more than one shipwreck, right? I mean, we always want to think of Paul's shipwreck. We think of this, this shipwreck over here in, in Acts chapter 27. But what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 11, 25? Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. At one point, Paul floated for at least 36 hours out in the ocean, wondering what was next. Maybe the sharks were circling. Maybe he wondered, well, Lord, is this the way I'm going home? Three times he suffered shipwrecks. We don't know how many times we're going to suffer a shipwreck in our lives, but a shipwreck designed by God for our good. But there are other kinds of shipwrecks. We didn't get to this half of the sermon tonight. Time is up. 
But spiritual shipwrecks are a different matter. We'll have to pick spiritual shipwrecks up next week. Spiritual shipwrecks are a different matter. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1.19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. There's a man who knows what shipwreck is all about. Here's a man who knows the cost of shipwreck. Here's a man who knows the pain of shipwreck. Here's a man who has seen other people floating in the water besides him. Here's a man who perhaps wondered on shipwrecks two and three, not the one we had in our text tonight, but shipwreck two and three, I wonder if I'm going to make it out of this one. We're not told anything about those shipwrecks and what God said to him. Or if anybody else drowned or was lost. But Paul knows what shipwrecks are about when he writes this. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Lord willing, next week we'll see how many different kinds of spiritual shipwreck that a man may have. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that all the negative things that come into our life are designed by you for our good and for your glory. We don't always understand them. But we can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Father, for your good, and you are our Father. And a Father who loves his children enough to give his only begotten Son to save us is certainly a Father who is working in our lives to conform us to the image of that Son, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And for that you only do us good. And for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing